We're coming up on act three. So remember, act one is where the characters are introduced. Act two is when the tension builds. Act three is when we bring it all home with a resolution not to be missed. And who better to kick it off than moderator Stanley Chi? Thank you. Welcome back from the coffee break. I'm sure that the signs here will be as great as the snacks and coffee. I'm Stanley Chi, and it's with greatest pleasure I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Hawa TM. There are two reasons that make me feel particularly honored to introduce Hawa. The first reason is Hawa is our most recent addition to the cohort of Seraphim KMH scholars. And Hava joined Stanford last year as assistant professor of bioengineering and of microbiology and immunology. As you know, I'm one of the first cohort of scholars. This makes me feel particularly special to introduce Hava. The second reason that uh, makes me feel special is Hava brings in a very highly diverse and uh, interdisciplinary background to CAMH. As Carolyn mentioned in the morning, this is one of the core missions at CAMH. Hava was originally from Senegal, and she went to France to complete her PhD in biophysics, where she started the biophysics of the immune cell nuclei. And then she flew across the uh, Atlantic Ocean to uh, did her, and did her postdoc research at the NIH. There, she did amazing work to combine the biophysics approaches, uh, advanced imaging, and the quantitative biology to study uh, an intriguing phenomenon of immune cells known as natosis. And now, Hava is at Stanford. Every time I talk to her about her research, I really got a double attack. Not only her neutrophil bombards my antigens, but also her research blow my mind. <laughs> With this double attack, I'm going to give stage to Hava so you can learn about the amazing work from her lab. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Stanley. Uh, can any, everyone hear me? Yeah, <clears throat> so thank you for this kind introduction. It is a real honor to speak at today's symposium, and I look forward to discussing with all of you. Uh, so what I would like to do today is talk about my lab's work towards uh, elucidating the fundamental uh, biophysical mechanism that drive immune cell function with the long-term aim of using this fundamental knowledge to re-engineer these cells and improve human health. So uh, in the lab, we are interested in neutrophil, which are the most abundant white blood cells in the circulation. Uh, and uh, they, uh, we produce about one billion of these cells per kilogram of body mass per day. And once producing the bone marrow, these cells are released into the circulation from where they can be recruited uh, to a tissue. Uh, uh, and we know most uh, of their recruitment in the context of infection. Um, so when they, for these cells to exit, the, uh, to rec be recruited to a tissue, they need to exit the circulation um, by squeezing through the endothelial layer. And then they need to move through the tightly packed in vivo environment to find a pathogen. After which they need to remodel at the cellular scale in order to uh, kill the pathogen, either intracellularly through phagocytosis, oops, uh, my aiming is weird, uh, uh, through phagocytosis, or extracellularly by releasing the cytotoxic content of their granules to the extracellular environment, or by going to the extent of releasing their genetic material to the extracellular environment. So, if for these cells and actually any circulating immune cells to accomplish their function, they need uh, to, uh, uh, to um, integrate the physical cues of their environment. So they need to deal with different type of physical forces. And those physical forces, they range from the sheer stress that they experience in the circulation, the high level of confinement or different mechanical properties of their target. Would the target be a pathogen or another cell? Uh, and uh, and uh, this raised this uh, important and unanswered question in the field, which is how do immune cells integrate these physical cues into their biochemical pathway to accomplish their various function in, the, in a physically challenging environment? And, and, this, uh, and answering this question is really critical for our ability to robustly re-engineer these cells just because of the intrinsic uh, connection between uh, the, these physical uh, forces and immune cell function. 
And so, and that's what my lab aims to do uh, uh, with the uh, focusing on this process of, uh, of netosis, uh, at the end of which neutrophil release their genetic material to the extracellular environment. So they release their DNA, which they coat with histone and antimicrobial peptide, as well as cytotoxic protein. And these nets can physically trap pathogen, as we can see on this electron micrograph. We have this yeast cell that has the DNA of nets tightly wrapped around it. And through this physical interaction, these nets uh, can kill pathogen, but also because of the content of cytotoxic protein in these nets, it can damage the host. It can lead to uh, uh, cell death, for instance. And we have a growing uh, number of evidence showing that there is a correlation between the abundance of nets and, uh, uh, and um, inflammation-related disease. So because of that, we really need the ability to control netosis as needed by the disease state. So for instance, we would need to, uh, the ability to induce it during infection, but also inhibit it during inflammation-related disease. But in order to get to that, we need to know the basic and fundamental mechanism that drive this process. Um, and uh, uh, I started working towards that during my postdoc, uh, where I uh, use high-resolution microscopy to identify uh, the cellular mechanism of netosis. So what we found was that uh, cells, the process of netosis would start with cells shedding vesicles that we showed to come from the plasma membrane in a process that we uh, uh, named plasma membrane vesiculation. Uh, and after this step of plasma membrane vesiculation, cells will change their nuclei. So we see the compaction of the chromatin, change in the shape of the nucleus, rupture of the nuclear envelope, which allows the chromatin to expand inside the cell, and then rupture of the uh, cell membrane, which allows the chromatin to exit the cell. And uh, by looking at uh, thousands of single neutrophil undergoing netosis over time, using stimulant to mimic uh, a sterile, a sterile inflammation, bacterial infection, or fungal infection, and using neutrophil from different sources, would that be human or mice, we uh, identify this common sequence of cellular event leading to netosis, showing that this, the process of netosis starts with cells remodeling their uh, cytoskeleton and their membrane before remodeling their nuclei, leading to the rupture of the nuclear envelope, uh, release of the DNA in the cytosol, and then rupture of the plasma membrane, which allows the DNA to exit. And this work is the, uh, is the foundation on which my lab is built. And um, our aim is to work towards, again, um, uh, uh, understanding and, and controlling netosis as needed by the specific disease state. And to get to that point, we identify several uh, uh, bottlenecks. And the first one is that there is a high redundancy in the molecular pathway of netosis. For instance, if we take the process of plasma membrane rupture, we can see six to seven uh, distinct molecular pathway that seems to be required. Um, uh, furthermore, we don't know of a way of predicting that this neutrophil is going to initiate netosis. We don't know how, uh, we don't know of a specific mechanism that drives netosis. So all these molecular pathways are also involved in other biological processes. And uh, also, we lack understanding of the damaging effect of netosis. And we really need to solve that should we, uh, uh, you know, uh, if we want to try to induce netosis during infection without overwhelming the host. The way my lab approaches uh, this question is by first taking a systems level cellular biophysics approach. So we go from the molecule to the cellular scale using biophysics as, as a connector between these two scales. We are looking at uh, a netosis initiation with the aim of finding a netosis biomarker. We are looking at the mechanism of netosis completion, specifically looking at how would cells rupture the nuclear envelope and plasma membrane, two steps that are required for the DNA to exit the cell. And we are looking at uh, what in netosis damages the host with the aim of uncoupling the pathogen killing ability of netosis from its detrimental effect. And just to maybe illustrate how we think about these questions and what I mean by cellular biophysics approach, uh, uh, let me walk you through how we think about one, how we think about nuclear, <laughs> nuclear rupture during netosis. 
So because we are interested in nuclear rupture, what we can do is go ahead and rupture the nuclear membrane. And this is something that we can do using atomic force microscopy, which is a technique that allows us to apply known force to the nucleus. And when we combine that with microscopy, we can look at the behavior of the object of interest, which is the nucleus here. What we found is that as cells progress towards netosis, the amount of force required to rupture the nuclear envelope decreases, suggesting that either there is an increase in pressure inside the nucleus so that it's just ready to pop, or that the membrane of the nucleus is getting weaker. This is something that we can address uh, measuring intranuclear pressure during the process. And what we found is that the intranuclear pressure increases as cells progress towards netosis. Then the question became, how do you build, how do you generate this pressure inside the nucleus? Then the hypothesis that we wanted to test is that as cells decompact their chromatin, there is a release of macromolecule inside the nucleus, and this macromolecule will lead to a generation of an osmotic pressure. And uh, as a proof of concept, we looked at histone, and what we found is that the, indeed the linker histone increases in mobility uh, after chromatin decompaction, so we'll be uh, moving more freely, suggesting presumably because it's uh, diffusing freely, but while the, uh, uh, the nucleosomal histone uh, doesn't move faster. So suggesting that during netosis we have this transition from a compacted chromatin where two nucleosomes are connected to each other by the linker histone to the compacted chromatin where the linker histones can, can float. With this in mind, we can turn to a mathematical modeling to estimate how much pressure can be generated by detaching linker, linker histone from the chromatin. So what I, what I just said is that as the linker histone detached, because we know the number of histone inside the, the, the nucleus, and provided that these histones remain inside the nucleus, we can compute a, a colloidal osmotic pressure. The other thing is that at steady state, the chromatin is negatively charged, and this charge is usually counterbalanced by the positive charge of histone. Now, if you remove histone, what, you, what, what happens is that the net negative charge of chromatin uh, increases, and then the system will need to bring in counter ion in order to uh, maintain electrostatic neutrality. This is an, uh, another uh, uh, osmotic pressure which is more ionic. So based on that, the, our working hypothesis is that chromatin decompaction by changing the physical chemical landscape of the nucleus is leading to this pressure generation that is rupturing the nuclear envelope. And beyond netosis, our approach of understanding, uh, you know, our, the current approach that we are using to, understanding, uh, to understand netosis uh, will allow us to no, uh, define the uh, physical principle and concepts that we need to understand how a neutrophil and also other cells interact with, uh, with their environment, how are, they, uh, how are they interacting with other cells and other um, and, uh, and pathogen in the environment, how are they recruited from the bloodstream to the tissue, but also from the bone marrow to the bloodstream. And what we want to do is build a quantitative understanding of neutrophil biology, which will give us the handle on the most abundant leukocyte in human. And with this handle, what we aim to do is to help with the treatment of infections and autoimmune disease, but also uh, uh, engineer new immune cell function. So with this, I will end. That was a very long one minute. Uh, I will end by, by thanking people that have been instrumental to my training, people that I had the chance to collaborate with, and members of my growing lab, people that, are, that I'm excited to see every single day, and I really look forward to seeing what happens in the coming years. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, questions for Hawa? A wonderful talk. I was just wondering, from, from model organisms or simple unicellular organisms, is there a, a system that, that does this of spilling the guts as a biological mechanism, or is this sort of lymphocyte specific? Single cell? I, I do, I'm not aware of. Uh, I know that uh, there is similar mechanism that has been described in plant where they would use, they would release extracellular DNA to fight fungi. Um, so it seems to be conserved through different species uh, in evolution, but multicellular. I don't know of a single cell. Now, if we think about biofilm, like the way you form a biofilm is by having some cell that would exclude their DNA, but this is, this is 
believed to be more of a way of making an extracellular matrix. I don't know whether it participates in keeping other um, bacteria away. Yeah. This is just such an amazing property of an immune cell to be able to do this. And um, is there any understanding of whether neutrophils gang up on sites of infection? So if one neutrophil gets triggered you know, to undergo the netosis program, do its neighbors get the hint that they might want to do that too? Yeah, that's, that's an important question that we are trying to ask, um, trying to see whether there is any communication between neutrophil that can trigger, that can help another one um, undergo netosis. This is known for migration, so neutrophil, they swarm. Like once the cell is moving, it leaves a trail that will attract other cells. Um, but we don't know that in the context of uh, netosis, and that's something that we are trying to address. I think like we have some preliminary da data indicating that uh, from uh, from a postdoc in the lab indicating that actually if you have too much n netosis, uh, you will just trap anything. So I, what I am thinking is that maybe there is a sort of selection in which neutrophil will undergo netosis so that you maintain a sort of homeostasis. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, and I couldn't help this like triggered memories of papers out of a DNA damage lab with Marco Foyani, in which he shows that nuclear envelope rupture can happen through actin reorganization in the cytoplasm and act have an active process of rupturing as opposed to just having like an increase in pressure. Is there any in indications that there's like cytoplasmic processes going on that may facilitate not just maybe it's a convergence of pressure plus an active cytoplasmic mm -hmm. mechanism. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know, these mechanism, they all revolve around the cytoskeleton. So it's, uh, I'm doing mitosis, you have microtubules that are pulling on the membrane to rupture it. Uh, during migration, it's usually either you, ha you are confining the cell, so you are just generating pressure on the cell, or, and then this also requires the actin cytoskeleton. So during netosis, the one, how it happened very early on is that the cell gets rid of all the cytoskeleton. So the actin microtubule and biomentin intermediate filament are gone. And uh, so this uh, suggests that we don't have a specific, uh, direct cytoskeletal generated force. Now, this doesn't exclude that, uh, like, because all this cytoskeleton, once it disassembles, what you are doing is that you are increasing, again, the amount of macromolecule inside the cell. So there, you might change the viscoelasticity of the cell, and this change in viscoelasticity might change the amount of the, the, the tension of the membrane. So uh, not cytoskeletal generated force, but maybe something from the cytosol in terms of osmolarity or crowding might be affecting the membrane. Nicole. How a really exciting stuff. I'm wondering, are there any known mechanisms by which pa uh, pathogens evade netosis or suppress netosis through modulating physical forces? Uh, modulating physical forces? Or otherwise. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so w there are pathogens that can uh, inhibit netosis so the one I know that is one of them, uh, but then this sort of whatever mechanism it is happens when the uh, before the biofilm formation. So once the pseudomona forms a biofilm, then the amount of netosis is is really high. Um, uh, Plasmodium falciparum can generate some DNAs type of molecule that can and that they can cleave their way out of uh, nets. So there are ways. So uh, there, there are ways by which pathogen can either inhibit netosis or escape out of it. Now, I would say degrading the DNA might be a physical mechanism, but I, 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 I but I, I, I can't say anything about like changing the osmolarity of the environment or something like that. Awesome, let's thank Hava again.